<coughs> I have an interest in uh, PKD research as well as cancer research, and it, it may scare you to hear that they're very similar diseases, but if you're going to choose one, choose PKD. Uh, and I'll t give you some examples of why they're similar. I mean, they're both uh, characterized by proliferation of cells, right? But in cancer, the proliferation basically goes everywhere, ultimately, and it's not a good thing. But the PKD, fortunately, it stays within the kidney. So I'll go over some details about that. I thought that's interesting. And I'll go over some of the science. If, I know this is a mostly a patient audience, and um, friends of patients, I guess, right? Correct. Uh, but I'll give you a little bit of science, if you're interested, and I'll, um, to make it complete. So I'll talk here about typical patient scores. This may be redundant for many of you. Uh, but I want to show you a friend of mine who's also a patient, uh, another professor at UC Davis, how I actually got into, interested in PKD. Okay, and then I'll talk a little bit about genetics. I know there's going to be a little, some genetics later. Um, and then the early changes in the kidneys, as well as conventional uh, treatment options, which as you probably know, there aren't that many. Uh, and then new, uh, briefly, some new areas. Okay, so this is a, a typical patient. Um, and uh, he showed it in 1982, this guy was 35 years old, and he noticed very mild blood pressure at arrest, ranging in the 120s to 150s. He had normal kidney function, normal UA. Okay, this is a typical uh, AD, autosomal dominant PKD patient. Um, his primary doctor didn't do anything. He, f he figured, you know, all right, here's a guy with a little bit of hypertension, normal urinalysis, normal everything. Uh, I'll treat his, uh, just watch him. That probably wasn't the brightest thing to do, but it wasn't me. Uh, this is what happened. So, <laughs> age 40, the guy's mother was diagnosed with PKD by ultrasound at age 62, and, and he doesn't remember if she had symptoms. Um, my patient B had a kidney ultrasound. The diagnosis was made on ultrasound, but still no symptoms. And this is a guy, this is a professor at UC Davis who is incredibly active. I mean, this is a kayaker. He's a mountain climber. He climbs, he looks good, he's skinny. Uh, so, you know, he, and here he had uh, the diagnosis. Kidneys were palpable. Kidney function was slightly abnormal. His creatinine was a little elevated. No pain, no infections. So eight years later, the hypertension persisted, no infections, and now the doctor, <coughs> the other doctor, was, was smart and started an ACE inhibitor for a little bit of hypertension. And now I, I took on this patient at 57. His creatinine was slowly increasing to 7 range, and I, I don't know how many people know about it creatinine, but I suspect most of you do, and as you know, this is quite high. Um, still, he felt fine, and this is also typical of PKD. You can have a very high creatinine and not feel like somebody else with acute kidney failure might feel. Mm -hmm. He was placed on peritoneal dialysis, uh, did great actually on peritoneal dialysis, no signs of what we call inflammation, that is, he didn't have peritonitis, he didn't have chronic infections, to, he had a normal CRP. Um, so finally, at age 58, uh, he had a, a living-related kidney transplant, and now he's, he's doing great. He's on these medications. This is a thiazide, uh, and genotyping of the kids, so all three of them actually have PKD, at least the gene. So PKD has been known for many, many years since Hippocrates. Uh, of course, he didn't call it PKD, but he said it arises from the gall and the mucus. Um, and here are some really old pictures, well, not, that, not Hippocrates, vintage, but you can see that people have known about this for, for quite a while. Now let me, I want to give you a quick trip uh, for the next few slides about, the, in general, about PKD, and then I want to go in a little bit more detail about each of these things. So it comes in two flavors, two forms, okay? The autosomal dominant PKD form is the one that generally affects adults. And you'll hear, I think, a little bit about the genetics of this later on. But um, what, what happens is you have to have an affected parent. If one of your parents is affected, then you have a 50% chance, you can see this guy here and this guy here, about a 50% chance of get, getting the disease because you get that affected allele or gene from one of your parents. Now, there are a, a high number of we call them de novo diseases, like 20 to, it's written 20 to 40 percent, you don't have a parent that is known to have the disease. And I'll talk a little bit about that later, but in general, this is the genetics. Usually causes symptoms in adulthood, but as you'll hear later in the panel, it can start as early as teenage. Um, 
Now this one probably is not anybody in this room. I would be surprised. This, this can have it, and you can see there's a poster about this right behind Valen here about um, ARPKD can take the life of an infant within hours. So we don't, we don't see a lot of ARPKD. Um, but you can see that in this case, you have a one in four chance of uh, having the disease, and you need two parents that, to be carriers. So this is classical Mendelian Peapod genetics. And um, think about the ADPKD, because that's what I'll be talking about. OK, what are the most common symptoms and signs of PKD? And none of these, of course, are specific for PKD. And back pain, as you know, can occur, is the most common reason people see their doctors. Anybody. So this, is, this does not tell you you have PKD, but these are the things that you might see. Headaches, frequent urinary tract infections. You can occasionally have cysts in kidneys. That's obviously not a symptom, but it's a sign. Um, and occasionally blood in the urine. Again, blood in the urine does not mean PKD. But all these together with a family history um, are suggestive. How do we obtain um, PKD diagnosis? Um, we commonly do, <laughs> this is Valen here, she let me use that slide. Um, you can see that she was, uh, her ultrasound, this is an MRI, shows pretty big kidneys. Here's normal, right here is a normal person, and you can see the fat, which shows up white, and in hers, uh, it takes up this entire space. So thank you for that slide. Um, so this is how we do the diagnosis. Usually ultrasound, occasionally MRI, if your kidney function is elevated, then the MRI is falling out of favor when you have to add contrast, but I don't think that's, that's really important for early diagnosis. Mostly it's ultrasound. Uh, and it's frequently, uh, I work in a nephrology clinic, obviously, and we frequently see PKD when we're working up something else. You know, you work up somebody with acute kidney failure due to uh, a drug or something, or, or um, dehydration or muscle injury, and then we'll see PKD on diagnosis, and we'll have no idea. The patient had no idea he had it. So it's, yeah, ultrasound is quite frequent in a way. And then family medical testing, if you know that your parent, one of your parents has a disease, then uh, you might want to get genetic testing, or you might not, for insurance reasons in this country. A lot of people say, you know, there's no treatment. Why do I need to know this? It's just going to hurt my insurance issues. Okay, and uh, the gene-based uh, test uh, is expensive. The gene, that the sequence is very large, and unlike other, other diseases, like in cancer diseases, there's no mutation in a specific area of the gene. So you have to sequence the entire gene, and since we're in Palo Alto near um, where they all did all this fancy sequencing, uh, you could know that that, that is uh, rife with errors. So you could have a false positive or a false negative uh, gene-based test, so you have to be a little careful about that, although that's getting better as, as the years move on. Okay? So as you probably all had ultrasounds, it doesn't hurt, people want to know that. Okay, so there's no cure for PKD yet. Um, and I say yet because I think there's a lot, since the genes were sequenced about, I think, 10, maybe 15 years ago, there's a, a ton of research going on. There's a lot of NIH funding. Not enough, of course, but there's a lot going on. So I think there, there may be a cure at some point down the line. Not tomorrow, not in a year, not 10 years, but I don't, I think it's probably coming with all the research and all that's known about the disease. So what do we do? What are the treatments that are used? And these are basically standard to, to most kidney patients. Medicine and dietary considerations to control high blood pressure, and you should say proteinuria on there too, if you have proteinuria, which is not super common in PKD patients. There are issues you can do, uh, specifically a low-protein diet. Uh, occasionally, when the cysts are huge or when the kidneys are impinging your breathing, when they get like Valens were, I suspect. Did you have a breathing problem? Yeah. At that point, uh, you might want to, the kidneys have to come out because you can't breathe. Okay? We can replace kidneys. We can't replace your breathing. Uh, if you get frequent infections, you have antibiotics, uh, and then, as you all know, dialysis and kidney transplant. Um, ultimately is, of course, superior to dialysis in most people. And then the new pipeline therapies that I'll touch on. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about science. Um, and this is your DNA that's chasing you here. <laughs> so these are some little known cocktail party facts that might interest you. Um, it's the most common potentially fatal 
monogenetic hereditary disease. And what that means is one gene causes the disease. As you may know, many diseases in medicine we're finding out are not monogenetic. There's several genes that need to be mutated. And cancer is a typical one because there's a lot of checkpoints for cancer. So usually you need more than one mutation. But for PKD, all you have is one mutation and one gene, and that's enough. It affects this number of people, uh, which is actually quite high. The most common genetic disease, uh, in kidney disease, not genetic disease, the most common genetic kidney disease, one in 800 <coughs> births. Cause of kidney failure in up to 10% of uh, end stage renal disease or, or <coughs> dialysis patients sitting next to you. Uh, there are two genes, and I'm, and I, okay, now there's the two flavors I talked about, ADPKD and ARPKD. Now, of the ADPKD, there's two genes that are possibly affected. There's PKD1, we call it, which is 85%, is the worst, the worst of the two, meaning there's more symptoms, it's earlier, and, um, and that. And PKD2 is the, uh, you, can, you can get away with PKD2 your whole life and not know you have it. Um, because PKD2 tend to, tends to be a slower, progressive, <coughs> early, a later age at onset, and we can see patients show up 60, 70, or as I mentioned, not at all with PKD2. Even though the pathology is quite similar, the, the genetics and the signaling and the biochemistry is similar. Now this is where it becomes similar to cancer, and I don't, I don't, I, I'm hesitant to say the word cancer to PKD patients because it's nothing, it's not the same uh, clinically, okay? It's the same similar genetics, and I mean similar uh, signaling, we call it, similar cell biology. And the reason that's interesting for PKD patients is that we can take, some, I think you mentioned, we can take some of the cancer drugs and potentially use them in PKD because there's similarity in the fact that there's uncontrolled cellular proliferation in both. But don't go home and think that, that I'm going to die from metastatic PKD because it doesn't happen. And in fact, for reasons that we kind of know, we're not totally sure, PKD patients are actually at a lower risk for kidney cancer. And the reason for that has to do with programmed cell death, which is increased in PKD, which is a good thing if you want to avoid cancer. So you just should know that the biochemistry is similar. And I, I, you know, I don't think I'm going to go into this now, but just the bottom line from the gene mutations are cell growth in both diseases. And um, you do need this second hit. What that means is, okay, so every tissue in your body, you have this one mutant gene from your mother or father, right? <laughs> How come your whole kidney doesn't turn into cysts? It actually doesn't. You have discrete cysts in discrete places. And I'll show you a picture of that. So why is not the whole every cell turning into a cyst? Well, it isn't. And the reason is because you need a second mutation or a second hit in each of those cells that turns into a cyst. And that's why some people suggest for early PKD patients, try to avoid things that might cause that second genetic mutation, which could be you know, you don't want to be an airline pilot, perhaps, because you get UV radiation and you might get more hits. You don't want to get a lot of x-rays if you can avoid it. There's evidence of taking, of, of perhaps down the line, taking antioxidants. That's not been proven yet, but that may be something uh, that may come out in some of the research. So preventing that second mutation is probably something worth thinking about. And I can go over that if anybody wants to know more about that diagram. Okay, I mentioned this as well. Uh, PKD is up there in terms of uh, the patients on dialysis. Um, diabetes and high blood pressure, of course, are the big ones. And, and since I work at a VA hospital, 90% of our patients have those two <coughs> diseases. Uh, and of course, this is unidentified. And PKD and interstitial nephritis is often a, a drug, uh, allergic reaction to a drug. So it's it's a big it's a big cause of dialysis patients. So this is from Valen, also a friend of hers. Yes, and this is I don't want to gross anybody out too much over lunch, but uh, these are big kidneys, and um, so that can happen. Okay, so a little bit of science here, um, just a very little bit. But these are the two two proteins encoded by the two genes, and they have PKD1. Remember, I mentioned that that uh, this is the most common. It's a huge, this is a big protein, you can see it here. Here's the cell membrane <clears throat> inside the cell, outside the cell. And this part here senses for something. We don't exactly know what, but
but we know that the sensing function, which is this thing waving in the, this is the urinary space here, urine is flowing out down here. This is sensing something. Uh, and in PKD, where that protein is mutated, the sensing function is messed up, okay? And then PKD2 is a much smaller protein, so in a sense it's easier to, to sequence the PKD2 gene, but it's very rare to have PKD2. So you can see that, that sequencing the gene that corresponds to this protein could be a, a real pain and not particularly accurate. Um, and these two things talk to each other. These two proteins talk to each other. So you need a functioning PKD1 protein and PKD2 protein. Just finally, it's probably involved in um, calcium signaling. <coughs> and we don't exactly know why, but these things regulate calcium going in through these various channels. And so the calcium in the cell <coughs> is messed up when you have uh, PKD mutations. And calcium is used for cells to talk to each other. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So cells, as you know, we're a bunch of cells, right? I mean, as opposed to a, a protozoan or a, it's, it's one cell. We're a bunch of cells. That's all we really are. And in order to turn into a human and be able to function, each cell has to communicate with its neighbor, right? Otherwise, we're just, you know, we're just like a, a um, um, out in the ocean. What's the thing that? that not a jellyfish, but the, what's the thing that, that boats run into that... Uh, um, oh, corals, thank you. <laughs> Coral is a bunch of cells functioning by themselves, right? But we're a bunch of cells that talk to each other. So we use that word talk, meaning that they signal to each other. Okay? That's what a lot of people study in the lab. Okay, so this is what I told you earlier about why you need that second hit. So the cis... If this is the tubule here, <clears throat> here's the, I don't know if you guys have seen much of this, here's the filtering unit called the glomerulus, and it feeds into these tubules which regulate salt and water. And the cysts occur on these tubules, and you can see it's not, in ARPKD, recessive form, it's one big fat cyst, but in ADPKD, PKD, which was, was, we're talking about here, they're discrete. So each cell that has that second mutation is turning into a hole. A cyst, okay? And as you get older, you get more and more of these mutations, these second hits, and you get more and more cysts, so that by the time you're, uh, you need the kidney to get out, it looked like the slide that I showed you a little while ago, which was full of cysts, okay? And it's interesting also, they become cut off from the tubule. They, they stop communicating with the tubule, they just get cut off, which is a problem with biomarker studies that we do, because we want stuff from the cysts to get into the urine so we can look for markers. And then, this is kind of cool, you can do this in the lab. You can, you can take some cells, kidney cells, and grow them on a dish, and they'll form these tubules with little cysts out pouching. So see how this looks kind of like that? So it's kind of neat that we can actually grow these cysts uh, in, in the lab. It's, it's the way we do the research. A little more science, this is probably more than I needed, but this just shows you the early events that occur, um, growth factors, and, and uh, things that cause cells to talk or not talk to each other. Ultimately, the late events I thought may be more interesting, um, things that mediate scarring or fibrosis um, and hypertension. These are late events that occur, uh, which we'll talk about, I guess. In the but you can see there's early events where you don't, have, where you just start developing the cyst, you won't have any symptoms, you'll have normal creatinine, and then the late events associated with scarring and inflammation, which is things that we can control. Some laundry lists here of, of things which may show, may indicate uh, ADPKD, and AD means autosomal dominant. Okay. Uh, the percentage of people with PKD who have, present with abdominal pain is quite high because the kidneys are growing, and I, I suspect there's some people in the room who can tell me how they present it, but uh, flank pain uh, is also quite high. Eucuria, sometimes you don't notice the blood in the urine, sometimes it's found on a routine screening physical, very common. <clears throat> if you have blood in the urine, it does, as I mentioned, it doesn't mean PKD, but if you're otherwise healthy, uh, it's something to think about. Headaches, I'll talk a little bit about more about that later. That can be a problem because you can get aneurysms in the brain, which can actually kill people with PKD, so I'm going to talk about that. Not every headache in a PKD patient means he has an aneurysm that's going to rupture, but I'll tell you a little bit more. And then sort of non-specific uh, kidney-type complaints, 
And then these are the things that you look for, kidney enlargement, liver cysts, and if there are some valve problems that you get, uh, heart valve problems are associated with PDA. I'm going to talk about that. Okay? So it affects a lot of things. Here's the, here's the person, and you can see there's a lot of different parts of him that are affected. And why is that? Because it's a gene mutation. So the gene is mutated, not just in the kidneys, but everywhere. It just manifests in the kidneys because the kidneys are uh, use that protein in the tubes. Okay, so when do we see evidence of uh, PKD? Now these are just graphs. Don't be scared <clears throat> by these graphs. These are, this is the age on the x-axis. And the percentage um, that are affected. And I want you to see that if you just look at, at hypertension, this HT is hypertension. So people in, in 81 now, people in their 20s is when they start having hypertension, if they have PKD. Uh, for type 2, well, the hypertension is pretty much the same. Okay, so hypertension shows up in, in your 20s. Well, my patient that I presented earlier was a little later than that. So if you have a, a, an affected family member, you want to get them started taking blood pressure uh, in their late teens, <clears throat> the latest. Chronic kidney disease tends to happen starting around age 30, CKD, chronic kidney disease. But for type 2, you can see it's much slower progression for CKD in, in type 2. Uh, ESRD, dialysis, or when your kidneys are, 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 uh, are not working anymore, happens much earlier in type 1, and uh, so patients, it's unusual to be 30 years old and on dialysis or needing a transplant, but it happens, right? Most people, about 50% of people, um, are 50-ish are before they're on dialysis or transplant. Uh, but, so it happens early, it can happen as late as 70, when you're 70, what? About 15% of people didn't need dialysis till they were 70, okay? And then the whole thing has shifted to the right here with, uh, with PK82. Okay, now I think I've talked about this before. When should, would you expect, suspect you might have the disease uh, if one parent has it, if you know it? Um, and now most people know, you know, my generation, I'm not that old, but I'm old. Uh, you know, we didn't have, we didn't really have the ultrasound. My parents didn't have ultrasound, not my generation. My, my parents' generation didn't have a lot of these imaging tests. So you wouldn't know. Okay, but now, of course, everybody has ultrasound, so if a parent has it, you have 50% chance there's another picture of the genetics. And I mentioned this before, and then I mentioned this also. It's probably not 40%, but, but we see a few patients who don't have a family history, and that can either be one of two things, one of three things. You can be adopted, of course. You could, the parents could not know. I mean, people can, depending on where you live, what country you're in, it maybe people weren't worked up for, for PKD, and your parents just don't know. Um, and finally, it can be what we call de novo mutations. That is, uh, for some reason, when the, the sperm and the egg got together and there was recombination of the DNA, there was a mutation in that particular gene that came out of the air. Okay? So that can happen. Just like a, a mutation can cause uh, Down syndrome or fat loss or any other number of diseases. So that's what we call de novo mutations. Okay, so now we'll go a little bit in, more in detail uh, about these things, and I want to talk. To, I want to focus on the cardiovascular complications because that's really something <coughs> that can be controlled or treated, and that's really the, one of the few things that we, other than you know, waiting for dialysis, it's one of the few things we can do to, to prolong the life of the kidney. And this, I don't know if you heard about this exhibit. This is, uh, I think, it came from China, and uh, where they took dead people and they injected their whole vasculature with wax. I think it was here not long ago. It, it, it just shows up at shopping malls, this exhibit, if you can believe it. So anyway, this is a guy, was a guy, and then this is only his blood vessels. You can't see very well because of the light, but it's kind of a good picture. Okay, so cardiovascular problems, and by cardiovascular I mean heart and blood vessels, are uh, major causes of morbidity or death and, and illness in ADPKD patients. Often this is not known to people, so that's why I want to emphasize it a little bit. It's generally indolent, meaning it's, it's asymptomatic and it's kind of sneaky. Sometimes, as I showed you about my first patient that I presented, no, he didn't know much about his uh, blood pressure. Nobody really cared much about it. 
Uh, and as you know, you can't feel blood pressure. I'm sure you've had talks on, on silent killer hypertension. So you can't feel blood pressure when it's a little bit elevated. So you need to recognize this. You need to treat this early. <clears throat> we think uh, there's a study going on now, actually, uh, to test this. But we think that uh, specific uh, drugs are probably better than others for treating hypertension and PKD. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But clearly, we do know in, in every kidney disease, it's the same. Treat the blood pressure aggressively and treat it early, OK? That can result in preservation of kidney function. Um, and then there are quite rare heart and, uh, and uh, cerebral aneurysm, heart uh, valve defeat problems and cerebral aneurysms that can be uh, life-threatening emergencies. So there can be a PKD emergency. So every patient needs to know uh, what to do about that. I think I'll skip over this. This is a little bit of, of, uh, of endocrinology uh, showing you what the, what the defects are. The bottom line is you have activation of this thing called the renin-angiotensin aldosterone system, or RAS, which is a, a system that the kidney, the body basically uses to, when we, when we left the ocean, you know, I don't know, a billion years ago, when we went from slime mold to, to land-dwelling creatures, we needed to take the ocean with us. So this, this is a very old hormone system that has uh, evolved to, uh, I can speak about evolution in Palo Alto, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is not Kansas. Um, we evolved to take the ocean with us. And it, it's interesting that, that your blood salt composition is very similar to seawater. So what we've done is we've taken that seawater and, and it's what's going through our, our veins. And the RAS system is the one that is responsible for holding on to salt and water. Okay? So when this is messed up in PKD, you tend to get hypertension. And this is often messed up in PKD. It's often elevated. Okay? And the valvular and aneurysm abnormalities are due to the same protein that causes the disease in the kidneys. It's also expressed in blood vessels. Remember I said there's a mutation that the gene you inherit from your mother or father is in all your tissues, including blood vessels. So you're going to have abnormalities in other things other than the kidney. Okay, so what are the cardiovascular complications? Hypertension, as I mentioned, something called <coughs> left ventricular hypertrophy, which means that the left side, the ventricle, is responsible for pumping blood out the aorta and through all to all your body parts, uh, is um, thickened, and this thickening. Uh, ultimately causes <clears throat> problems with pumping ability. When it gets really thick, it actually gets in the way of pumping. So you can think about this thick muscle that has a hard time pumping, and it can also affect the outflow of the blood. So this can be the result of hypertension, but it can also be the result of PKD gene mutation. Can you do anything for that? Yeah. Right here. Right here. You're, you're planted. Drug, you can take drugs, actually the ACE inhibitors and ARBs will reverse LVH. So if you don't wait till it gets really severe, you can treat it, okay? Heart valve abnormalities are rare. Mitral valve prolapse is one. I'll go over those very briefly. Uh, women, uh, tall, skinny women are at more risk for mitral valve abnormalities. And then the brain aneurysms. Hypertension, other than kidney insufficiency, hypertension is the most common, most treatable complication. So if you take home nothing from this talk, take home thing you've probably heard in every other kidney lecture, treat the blood pressure. And you can read this. Treat you know, hypertension preserves kidney function, reverses LVH, <clears throat> and prevents or delays many of the complications of uh, many organs. So the prevalence of hypertension, here's another graph, sorry about that, but uh, you can see that um, it's very prevalent. Now this is, the, the open bars are PKD patients. And you can see that the prevalence of those with hypertension with PKD it's quite so between 20 and 34, 60 percent of PKD patients have hypertension. Interesting, the black bars are unaffected relatives, and that's kind of high. So there's something going on with the unaffected relatives. But anyway, because uh, you know, 30 percent of 20 to 34 year olds don't normally have hypertension. But look at the clear bars, and you can see that in males, <clears throat> there's a higher incidence as you get older than than with females, which is which is basically this is women, men. Okay, so it's very prevalent in PKD and every kidney disease. Um, frequent screen, screening uh, at all ages, uh, I would say, you know, between zero and 19, and even that, there's 15%. Okay, 
whereas none of the unaffected relatives. So 15% of people in that age range had hypertension. So it needs to be checked. Okay, so what are some complications of untreated hypertension? Worsening kidney function, this thing called LVH, left ventricular hypertrophy, which leads to heart failure if untreated. Stroke and a TIA, which is a mini stroke, uh, are, as you probably know, are complications. And this is not specific for PKD, this is everything, so I'm sure you've heard this. General vascular disease or atherosclerosis, and you can see here's an atherosclerotic lesion right there in an artery. And then uh, you can cause, if you have an aneurysm due to PKD and your blood pressure gets sky high, that can cause rupture. Okay, so here's your question. How do we treat patients with um, hypertension, ADPK patients with hypertension? Actually, I didn't give the, the numbers uh, uh, for the goal. The goal is thought to be what everybody says, it's 120 over 80. Now, in kidney disease, <clears throat> there's a problem. The lower you go, it's probably better. But in some studies, if, you, if you're older or if you have heart disease, when you go too low, we have what's called a J-point. So when you go too low sometimes, you don't get good perfusion and you have problems with that. But I think it's safe to say, <clears throat> if you're relatively healthy, without heart disease or without serious heart disease, as low as you can go is what you want to do. Now, you don't want to pile on medications to do that, but you certainly want lifestyle changes, uh, exercise, salt restriction, um, uh, to try to get as low as you can go without piling on medications. Okay, so really it's, it's as low as you can go, but 120 over 80 is probably the goal. Um, <clears throat> what's the optimal for, hype, for PKD? There have been studies looking at this, but none of them has been conclusive because the power, as we said, aren't enough patients in these studies. I don't know why. It should be done, but it hasn't been. Um, however, there exist animal studies showing that inhibition of this thing that I mentioned earlier, the RAS system, with ACE inhibitors or ARBs, uh, are, uh, this is the best way to go, the best drugs to use, okay? So if you have hypertension <clears throat> with PKD, you should be on one of these. There's a study going on right now, actually the study's over, the data's being analyzed, to look at this question, uh, since we're not mice, to see if, if in, in humans this data holds up that you hire that, that these are the, the right medicines to use. And since it's not ethical to take somebody off an ACE inhibitor, the way the study was designed was adding another agent that works on the same pathway. So we're comparing patients with the ACE plus R <clears throat> versus the ACE alone and seeing uh, kidney function as a function of that over many years. Okay? So this study is already done. Uh, we should have the answers, I would think, uh, within a, a year or so. Goal blood pressure, as I mentioned, uh, probably less than 120 over 80. Um, and there was one study showing this. And this is, you can ignore, this is just uh, looking at calcium channel blockers. Didn't do as well as um, ARBs in one study, a very small study. Okay, so what are the consensus recommendations for hypertension control in PKD? And this consensus means not based on data necessarily, but just the smart people, not me, the smart people who do PKD get together in a big room and over a couple of uh, cups of coffee and hash it all out. So with they and, Bru and Glenn Chertow, who is the Stanford guy, is on all of those. He's, he's, uh, he's got long tentacles. Uh, so, um, this is what we say, blood pressure 120 rating or better, start ACE or ARB, um, <clears throat> even if, if normal blood pressure and microalbuminuria. So if you have normal blood pressure, the jury's still out about whether you should be on an ACE or ARB. Personally, I probably would take it because there's minimal complications, um, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend that to everybody. If you just, if you have normal blood pressure and the diagnosis of PKD, I would not recommend that. Okay? But if you have albuminuria or a little bit of proteinuria, then there's no question that you should be on an ACE or an R. Okay? So that's a take home point. Now, the problem is with pregnant women or women of childbearing age, ACE and ARBs are contraindicated. So if you're, you know, you're going to be pregnant or you're at risk of being pregnant, well, I don't know if it's a risk, 
but if you might get pregnant, how's that? <laughs> this is a risk. But if you might get pregnant, you shouldn't be on those, okay? And that's really important. I don't know how much to stress that, but that's the way it is, okay? Um, and all, P all PKD patients and all everybody, all kidney patients, these uh, need to be uh, um, watched. So what's the caveat about BP treatment in, in PKD? Well, it doesn't behave like the standard proteinuric glomerular. In other words, it doesn't really behave like the standard kidney diseases that have proteinuria. Um, there's a less of a, less of a beneficial effect of reducing protein in PKD patients, and we don't really know why. We still do it, but it's less than some of the other diseases like diabetes. Diabetes, we know, getting rid of that protein is absolutely wonderful. You want to do that as best you can, but in PKD, maybe, maybe it's not as, the effect isn't so great. Still likely the proteinuria is risk factor, so you should have your protein, protein measured in the urine regularly. Um, PKD, uh, people who get pregnant who have PKD can accelerate the course of the disease. Okay? That's something you should know. I think it, it's not a contraindication to getting pregnant, but, but you should know that if you do, that could accelerate the disease. Okay, so what about drugs? Uh, so for heart valve abnormalities, echocardiography, uh, is usually done. That's like an ultrasound of the heart. Doesn't hurt at all. And here's a picture of. Actually, I think that's a normal heart. And here's the study showing a percentage of people with PKD who have these various scary-sounding valvular diseases. They really aren't as scary as you might think. Mitral valve prolapse is very actually quite common. I mentioned in tall, skinny women, um, and um, uh, really, there's not much to be done about it. Uh, it it's, it's basically doesn't progress, okay? Some of these other ones, aortic incompetence, mitral incompetence, these are a little more serious. And you can see the mitral incompetence is in the third of people, so that's something to, to look into. What do we do about heart valve problems? Um, frequent heart exam, you can actually use that stethoscope to hear these. Uh, I know doctors coming out of med school now don't know what the stethoscope is. And they, they think it's just a little toy that they put in their, you know, around their neck so they'd be on a TV show and show they're a doctor. But actually, it is very useful. Um, and valve abnormalities, you can tell by listening. You don't need a fancy ultrasound, which costs about 500 bucks. You don't need a, uh, anything else. You just need your ears and you need to know what it sounds like. And, you know, if you have PKD, you could probably go on the internet and figure out what it sounds like. I mean, it's, it's, it's very easy. It really is. So, doctor in any case, and maybe the patient should listen to the heart frequently. If you have a valve disease, if you're one of the few that do, um, then you watch for symptoms of heart failure, shortness of breath, swelling, and, and you know, kidney failure can cause swelling too, but so can heart disease. So sometimes it's a little hard to figure out the difference. And this is a little controversial, but I think most doctors recommend if you do have valvular disease, that you take an antibiotic before you have a, minor surgery or even a dental procedure because when they go in there and scrape your teeth they send bacteria through your bloodstream and some of those bacteria like to live on heart valves which can cause what's called endocarditis which is a really nasty disease which can kill you okay so probably and you should talk to your own doctor about this you should probably be on antibiotic prophylaxis meaning a couple of pills before your dental procedure okay surgery and the rare cases where these valvular diseases get out of control, uh, heart to open heart surgery. Okay, now this is the one that's a little more frightening, um, and everybody should, should know about this. Um, these intracranial aneurysms is when we have emergencies with PKD. And you have to keep in mind that uh, they're clustered in families, so if you have a family member who has one of these, or has, God forbid, had a, a rupture of one and died, then you're at risk. So the, the sages who talk about you know, health care benefits of screening and count the, the money uh, have decided that we don't screen everybody, okay? Now, I would like to screen everybody, but <clears throat> we're not allowed to because of the people who run the health care system. So, in that case, we only screen people who have the family history or high risk, like an airplane pilot. You don't want an airplane pilot to rupture an aneurysm, <laughs> right? Or a bus driver or, you know, a surgeon. So if you're in a high-risk profession, you might want to screen without any previous history, okay? 
and uh, MRA, uh, MR angiogram, or, which is a, a nuclear magnetic test with this dye, uh, is a preferred choice. If you have kidney function that's altered, then you can't get an MRI anymore because of this really weird disease that happens there. So that, that it's probably not important. Um, okay, so this is the one that, that you should probably know about. If you're a PKD patient and you have a really bad headache, get your butt to the ER, okay? And I know that's nonspecific. Uh, everybody has headaches. But classically, these aneurysms are what we call thunderclap headaches, where you just have never had a headache so bad it comes on suddenly. It doesn't hurt to go have a test done, right? Get, it's easy to get an MRA of your head. All right, and that'll rule it out. So if you're, I don't know if anybody knows anybody who's had this. I've actually not seen this happen. It's relatively rare, but if it happens, the game's over. So that's why this is something that sudden onset severe headaches should prompt evaluation, with or without family history. Okay? You guys probably know that, right? And here's what you do. Tell the ER what's going on if this happens, or tell your family member to tell somebody in the ER before this happens that if I have a really bad headache or all of a sudden I go unconscious, I have PKD and I need an MRA, okay? I risk for sealant, three reminders. Because not all, I mean, if you're in the middle of nowhere, they may not have heard of PKD, right? So this is something that you should tell the family member or, you know, have it available for a doctor. Put it on your insurance card, that'll do it. I have a question. Yeah? If you have an MRA done and there's nothing, can you develop a link? Unusual. Okay. Unusual. So if you have an MRA, chances are you're okay. Now, there are rare cases when it can show up, so I would still keep that in mind, but yes, uh, usually it's there, uh, it's there. And this has to be a surgical treatment, nobody wants uh, a, head, a hole drilled in their head, but that's really how you treat this. Another question? Yeah. If you don't have good kidney function and you can't get an MRA, then how do you check? Well, if you don't, if you can't get an MRA, Please repeat then the question. have to do um, uh, IVP, intravenous pilogram, to, to shoot dye up there, and of course that risks to it, or you could do a non-contrast CT without contrast, uh, and sometimes was, you can see. I have family history. My grandfather died at like 30. Yeah. My father died. My mind probably didn't want to do it because she said my kidney function won't hold it. Well, see, the MRA story is, is really kind of a problem because there's this really weird fibrosing disease called NSF, which um, nephrogenic sclerosing fibrosis, which is very, very rare, but it's associated with the dye from an MRA. So my guess is if you were to sign something saying, I'm willing to take that risk, they could do an MRA. I certainly would. I mean, as I say, the risk is, is vanishingly small of having this weird thing. The, the, the stuff that we give, gadolinium, is not nephrotoxic. So everybody was getting MRAs all the time until about five years ago when this weird disease showed up, NSF, and now all the radiologists are petrified that they're going to get sued if, they, if somebody develops NSF with their gadolinium. So, Bottom line, I would, I would, that's what I would do. I would say I'm willing to take that risk because I want to know if I have a, an aneurysm. So what are the treatment targets? How do we treat? I've talked about that, but let me summarize here. The basically validated treatments are treat hypertension, treat proteinuria, treat urinary tract infection or cyst infection. I didn't talk about kidney stones, but uh, PKD patients have a higher incidence of kidney stones. And obviously, those are very uncomfortable. The male equivalent of childbirth. Uh, that's what I've been told. I haven't ever had one. Um, you want to prevent those because it's no fun and they can cause damage. Watch for your cranial aneurysms. And this I didn't, let me talk about this for a brief second. One of the problems in PKD is an increase of something called cyclic AMP, which is a fancy name for a, one of these signaling proteins. And that's manifested by increased levels of this thing called vasopressin. So we know that vasopressin worsens the progression of PKD. So there's a study looking at antagonists of vasopressin. But you know what also antagonizes vasopressin is water. If you drink a lot of water and expand your, we call it expand your blood volume, then that's going to shut off or, or put AVP way down. And so that's probably a treatment. There was an article in one of the medical journals about, um, about that. There's no study been done, but um, water, drinking water is probably as good a treatment as any for uh, PKD patients. And this is starting early. 
Now, you don't want to drink salt water, obviously. You don't want to worsen your hypertension, but just regular old water. Don't get thirsty too much. Be sure you've got uh, enough water on board. Now, if you have heart failure, of course, that becomes different. But I'm talking about young, youngish like me, healthy patients uh, who uh, don't mind drinking water. And I just noticed you have water in the back, so help yourself. When I gave this talk to uh, the thing in San Diego, the PKD Foundation, I, I mentioned this, showed this slide, and at the break, everybody, there's a line of water. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess it worked. Of course, it was a hot day. Dialysis and you know, transplantation. Now, what are some future things that are being looked at? Fancy word for a chemical that inhibits um, signaling proteins that talk to other cells. Vasopressin inhibitors, which is the same as this. You can, there's, there's a trial going on with 12 Um I'm not sure what the status is of the trial. Maybe you guys know, but this is, hasn't been proven. Uh, cystic fibrosis transporter inhibition. Cystic fibrosis is also a problem with fluid transit. So, um, hence the word the cystic part of it. So, this is a pulmonary disease, but some people have tried, tried, decided to try these CFTR uh, inhibitors in PKD. So, that's undergoing uh, trials. mTOR inhibitors, uh, as you, many of you who are transplant patients may be on an mTOR inhibitor, like rapamycin, sirolimus, but uh, there was a lot of thought about this being helpful for PKD. Two big studies came out and uh, just a, a year ago or so, I think, and they, they showed that while they decreased kidney size, they prevented, they slowed down increase in kidney size. They didn't affect outcome. So everybody was pretty upset about that because everybody, you know, in animals, they work great and they're doing the right thing by not allowing the kidneys to get bigger but it didn't affect when you went on dialysis. So I think mTOR inhibitors may be dead for, for a PKD. But I, I, I won't say that. I heard a couple of groans. I mean, uh, people, there's always talk about the study being flawed, and I'm sure it'll happen again. But for now, put it that way, I probably wouldn't use it. But you know, there's, there's risks to the sizes of the cysts. And if it That's slows true. down the growth Absolutely. of the cysts. Absolutely. Well, but the problem is, helpful. these are not, this is not aspirin. Right, so these are very powerful drugs, immune suppressive drugs, and as you know, if you're on them uh, for transplant, you don't want to just give these for that potential, but it's something to think about. Somatostatin analogs, this is a growth factor, it was being evaluated, and then these are, are really, uh, we're actually studying some of these, uh, which work great in mice, by the way, but, yeah. What about the neuropathy of Um, I Please repeat the questions. Oh, I'm sorry. He said, what about neuropathy of the feet and hands? I don't see that very much in PKD patients. Um, that's, an, that's a new one for me. I, I haven't heard of that. You guys? You're going to talk about it. Okay. Okay, so this is what I mentioned. I think this is really important, although there's no, whoops, not a lot of data here showing that avoidance of that second hit by not getting a lot of radiation, not going on, not being an airplane pilot, not getting, if you can avoid these dental x-rays, that they, the dentists seem to love to take dental x-rays, um, avoid them, okay? Avoid x-ray x-rays, and CT scans have a huge dose of x-rays. You don't want to affect, you don't want to have your kidneys uh, affected by these x-rays, because you could get that other second hit and cause more cysts to form. And then every branch of medicine, there's the anti-inflammatory story, which may be important to PKD because of the, the late inflammation. So the optimal treatment, of course, is transplant. As you know, in this room, I'm sure it's preferable to dialysis if possible. Um, and this is, you know, a lot of kidney disease, we get scared because it could, like lupus or, or focal sclerosis, it can recur. But obviously, there's no recur. Unless you happen to have gotten a PKD kidney from somebody, which I don't think ever happens. Uh, it's not going to recur. So that, this is the cure, transplantation. And I think that's it. So.